Hey guys, and welcome back to Z3Cubing. Today I'm going to show you how to calculate the number of possible positions on a 2x2 and 4x4 Rubik's Cube. So today I'm going to be walking you guys through the process of calculating the total number of possible positions on these two cubes. So basically, starting at a solved state, this is one position, this is another position, this is another one, and you can count all those positions and get up to 3 million for this cube, and this huge number for this cube. Now I actually just recently made a video doing these exact same type of calculations, but on a normal 3x3 Rubik's Cube, so I'm going to assume that you have watched that video before watching this one. So if you haven't watched it yet, just click in the description down below, there'll be a link to it right there. But basically I'm going to go over a lot of the basic concepts with calculating like the number of permutations and orientations of different pieces that you're going to need to know in this video. I'm just going to assume that you've watched that. Now we're going to start off by calculating the number of possible positions in a 2x2 Rubik's Cube because as you may have guessed from the relatively small number of positions compared to something like a 3x3 or 4x4, it's actually relatively simple to calculate this number. Also, once we've learned how to do that, we can actually apply that to a 4x4 because the corners of a 2x2, it's all corners, apply exactly to the corners of a 4x4. So basically we can use the number of possible permutations on a 2x2 as a starting point for the 4x4 because the 8 corners of this cube act exactly the same as the 8 corners of this cube. Anyway, starting off with the 2x2, the calculation for this cube is actually very similar to that of a 3x3, except that there's fewer pieces, so that should make it quite a bit simpler, but there is one big distinction. On a 3x3, you have center pieces, and basically if you remember from my last video, the core of the cube, these six center pieces, don't actually move around relative to each other, they're all connected on the inside in one particular way, but they act as sort of like a reference frame from which all the rest of the pieces are put onto the cube. And so basically you can kind of count the number of different ways that you can move around these other pieces relative to that core, but the core always stays in one place. So that means once we start calculating the number of possible positions on this cube, because there's no fixed core or reference frame that stays in a constant orientation, we're going to be counting this state that I have the cube in right now as one unique state, but we're also going to be counting this state right here as a totally different unique state. This one is also going to be counted as a totally different unique state as with this one and this one and this one. Obviously all those states are totally exactly the same, but we're going to be counting each of those as different states, which is a problem. So once we get our total number of positions for this cube, we're going to have to divide that by the number of different orientations there are to hold the cube in. Because basically every single scramble that you can put the cube into, we're counting that a whole bunch of different times, and we don't want to do that. So we have to compensate by dividing by the number of orientations. We can calculate how many orientations there are real quick. Of course we can have white on top, or we can have green on top, or yellow, or any of six different colors. And now once we've chosen which color to go on top, let's say green, we can now count out the number of different ways that we can hold the cube with green on top. So there's one, two, three, and four. So there's six different sides that you can hold on the top, and for each of those six different sides, there's four ways that you can hold it. So that of course comes out to six times four, which is just 24. And so once we get our final number, we're going to have to divide that by 24. And again, that's because there's no reference frame on even layered cubes. There's no core of centerpieces that always stay in the exact same spot from which you can build all the rest of the pieces up from there. Instead, we're forced to just count every single scramble 24 times and then divide by that number at the end. So from here on out, our calculation is going to be exactly the same as a 3x3, except it's actually going to be quite a bit easier because we only have one type of piece to deal with. We have eight corners around the cube, and each of those eight corners has three different colors on it. So if you remember, we started off by calculating the number of different permutations of these corners, and so basically the number of different ways that you can arrange eight different objects, given eight slots to put those objects into. And then we went on to calculate the number of different combinations of orientations of those eight corners, given that they each have three different ways that they can be oriented. So starting with permutations, you should remember that we had eight different slots to put corner pieces into, and then we had eight different corner pieces to put into those slots. So starting with the first slot right here, we have eight different choices. And then once we choose one to go into there, we now have seven different choices for the second one. So we multiply that in there. We now have six different choices. And we go on and on and on multiplying these numbers in decreasing order until we have just one slot left and there's only one more piece to put into that slot. So we have times one at the end. And this big string of numbers can be written as just eight exclamation mark, which is said eight factorial. Now when it comes to the number of different orientations or the number of different ways that we can rotate around each of these corner pieces on the cube without actually turning the sides like this. For the first corner piece right here, we have three different ways we can rotate it. For the next one, we also have another three, so those multiply together. Next one, we also have another three, on and on and on, until we have the last three for the last corner, and that can be written as just three multiplied by itself eight times, which is raised to the eighth power. But if you remember, there are actually some states of the cube that are just impossible to get to because one corner piece is rotated incorrectly. And so basically the way you can think about it is that the first seven corners on the cube, you can rotate any way that you want. 
but once you get to the last corner, that corner is kind of predetermined in a way by the other seven. And so instead of writing three to the eighth, we bump it down to three to the seventh, because you can't really choose the orientation of all eight of those corner pieces. The last one's predetermined. You can only choose seven. And so taking these two numbers and writing them into our expression up here, we now have the complete total number of possible positions on a two by two Rubik's cube. We can check our work on a calculator just like this. So we can do eight factorial. Again, factorial, we move over, and press that button right there, times three raised to the seventh power, divide that all by 24, and we get 3,674,160. Number of possible positions on a two by two. All right, so now it's time for the cube you've all been waiting for, the four by four. So the thing is, the number that we just calculated up here for a two by two is a very good starting place for the four by four because pretty much everything applies to this cube as well. The whole thing with not having a reference frame and having to divide by 24, that is exactly the same thing because it's an even layered cube, it doesn't have a core, and you can rotate each scramble 24 different ways. And also we have eight corners around the cube, so that gives you those permutations, as well as the orientations up here, three different ways each of those corners can be rotated. Everything applies in exactly the same way on a four by four. So we can start off our calculation by just writing the same thing that we have over there. All right, so now it's time for the edge pieces. There's 24 different edges around a cube, twice as many as the 12 you would find on a normal three by three, but these edges actually work a lot differently on the four by four than they do on the three by three. On a three by three, we had to count the number of different places that those 12 edges can be, and then the number of different orientations that they could be in, because each edge could have two different ways that it could be flipped around like this. But if you take apart a 4x4, you'll notice something. You can't actually take one edge and just flip it around like this. The piece just does not fit in there the other way around. Each edge only has one possible orientation, which actually makes things a lot simpler for us. And another interesting thing you may not have first realized is that every one of these 24 edge pieces around the cube is totally unique to all the other edge pieces. It may look like you have two edge pieces on every side that are the exact same colors, but that's actually not true. If you take a look at the pieces on the inside, like this, you can tell that if you line them up similarly like this, they have different colors. So this one's white on this side, this one's green on this side. So they're actually totally unique to each other, and that means that we can do our calculation very easily. This is just like earlier, where we had eight unique corner pieces around the cube, and eight slots for those corner pieces to go into. That gave us eight factorial, or eight times seven times six, all the way down, different positions that those eight corner pieces can go into. Now, similarly, we have 24 different totally unique edge pieces, and 24 slots for those edge pieces to go into. And so that, of course, will give us 24 factorial, different ways that you can arrange all those 24 edge pieces. That works because each edge is completely unique of all the other ones. Also, since you can't take one edge and just flip it around in its place, you don't have to worry at all about any orientations of these pieces. All you have to worry about is the permutations, and we have that accounted for all right there. All right, so now finally onto the centers. So much like the edge pieces we were just talking about, there are a total of 24 different center pieces all the way around the cube. And also much like the edge pieces we were just talking about, there's no need to worry about the orientation of these pieces because there's no actual way to rotate a centerpiece in its place. There's only one orientation, no need to worry about any other ones. So you might think that you'd just be able to do this, multiply on 24 factorial for your 24 different centers, and just be done with it. But it's actually not quite that simple. The problem comes around because, unlike the edge pieces, not all 24 of the centers around the cube are unique. In fact, on each side of the puzzle, you have four centerpieces that are totally indistinguishable. So that totally messes up our calculation because actually what we're doing is if you had two of these centerpieces that were just flipped around, so two of these white pieces flipped around, we're counting that as a totally different permutation as if you hadn't swapped those pieces around. So we're actually over counting by a lot. The thing is for just one position on the cube, there's a whole bunch of different ways that these centerpieces can be kind of mixed up all with each other. So you can have only these two centerpieces flipped around, it'll still look exactly the same. You can have only these two centerpieces flipped around, or you can have these two and these two, or these two and these two and these two and these two. You have to calculate how many different ways these centerpieces can be mixed up like this without actually changing the position of the cube, because we're counting every single one of those combinations when we should only be counting one position. So basically right now we need to figure out the total number of different arrangements of all of these centerpieces around the cube, basically the total number of different ways that we can mix them up without actually changing what state the cube is in. So you can mix around two of these yellow pieces without actually changing the fact that the yellow side is solved. Anyway, we can start off with the white side. We have our four centerpieces right here. This is one position, this is another one, this is another one. We need to count how many there are for one side. And so we can do this very similarly to the way that we've calculated the number of permutations in the past. So we have four different slots and we have four different edge pieces to go into those slots. So for our first slot right here, we have four different choices. Let's just choose this one right here. So, so far we've had four choices. Now moving on to our next slot right here, we now have three different choices of which centerpiece to put in here. Let's choose this one right here. So times three. Now we have two more choices. So let's choose this one for this slot times two. And now finally we have only one choice for this slot. So we have to put this one in right here times one, and that of course equals four factorial. So there are four factorial different ways we can arrange the centers of one color of the cube, in this case white. 
We still do have to account for the other five colors though. So what we have to do is actually multiply four factorial by itself six times, one for each color of the cube. Because for each of those four factorial combinations of the white pieces that we just calculated, there's also another four factorial combination of the red pieces and the yellow pieces and the blue pieces on and on and on. So we can write all of this as just four factorial raised to the sixth power. So if you remember, we actually now have to divide our whole calculation by this number because every single position on the cube, we were counting this many extra times because of course the centers are not unique. Anyway, we should now have correctly calculated the total number of possible positions on a four x four Rubik's cube. Once again, we can go ahead and plug this expression into a calculator just to see how crazy big this number is. So we have eight factorial times three raised to the seventh power times 24 factorial times another 24 factorial all that divided by 24 and also divided by four factorial raised to the sixth power. We can press enter on here and we have 7.401 times 10 to the 45, which is an amazingly huge number. You can say that as 7.4 quarter decillion, or you could read out the whole number, but I don't think I have time for that today. Anyway, that's pretty much it for calculating the total number of possible positions on these two cubes. It was definitely quite a bit more difficult than calculating it on a normal three by three, but I hope you guys were able to follow along for at least most of it. If there's anything in particular you need help with understanding, be sure and leave a comment down below and I'll be able to explain a little bit better in text. But anyway, that's pretty much it for these ridiculously large numbers. If there's any other mathematical cubing videos you'd like me to make like this in the future, be sure and let me know down in the comments below. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time.